Finally, I comprehend the beauty of Griffith's vision for the future of Berserk Deluxe Edition 12. As of this week, I am officially caught up on Berserk with Deluxe Edition releases. Deluxe Edition 13 will be released later this week, and then I will no longer be caught up. But for all the fans who have been waiting for Deluxe Edition 13 to continue on to reading Berserk, uh, man, I get it. This wait of a full 24 hours since I finished Deluxe Edition 12 has been just brutal. I, huh, I fully understand that. And once I get and read Deluxe Edition 13 and then the only couple volumes that have been made available after that, I have no idea what I am going to do with my life. But I will be doing volume reviews of Berserk whenever they are released. No, I don't plan on doing chapter reviews because let's be honest, that would be kind of milking it and it would start taking up just a lot of my channel once it's back from hiatus. So once it is back and volumes are finished, I will be counting on you all to keep me informed on when that's done so I can continue the read along and tell the series we all love and adore comes to a conclusion. And wow, 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 does it feel Weird to even think about that. But without any further ado, I'm gonna pull these obnoxious contacts out of my eyes so I can actually read, and we are going to walk on through a controversial for me section of Berserk. It has a lot of highs, but some surprising lows as well. Let's go ahead and dive on into it. Where we had left off, the Emperor Ganeshka had just transformed himself into a demon god in an attempt to match the power he felt from Griffith at their last encounter. Emerging from the reincarnation pit, Ganeshka had transformed into a pillaring monster of tentacles and faces. Stretching high into the sky, the shadow of Ganeshka fell over the hundreds of thousands in attendance, seen from miles away. The kaiju that was the demon god began to move. Crushing his own forces, Ganeshka walked towards the light in the distance, the light that was Griffith. From the body of Ganeshka, an army of monsters begins to move towards Griffith's forces. Look! A swarm of smaller monsters rose up! They're coming this way! Sir Hawk! Lord Griffith! Lord Griffith! Band of the Hawk! Griffith calls. Assume an enchilon formation! Cannons load, crossbow strings stretch. Hear me, lords of the Midland, as well as all of those who volunteered to be here. I ask you to guard His Holiness the Pontiff, Her Highness the Princess, and the people of Windham. We shall, is called in return. When the princess protests at Griffith's intention to fight, he says, Sonia, stay with his holiness and her highness. Mule, protect the three of them. Demonic release, sending his twisted soldiers forward first. Nosferatu Zod among them. Griffith's lieutenants all turn into their true forms, revealing the beasts that serve him. The two demonic forces clash, ripping into each other. Massive beasts from both sides colliding. We see the reaction of Griffith's forces, seeing the true forms of the monsters among them. Why is he leading such demons? What the hell is the hawk? You idiots! Calls the cult girl, telepathically speaking to the armies, as Ganeshka walks towards them through the clouds. Humans? Demons? What does it matter? So what if they aren't human? So what if they're demons? Who's that shedding blood over there? Who's that risking their lives? Humans? Demons? No. Wrong. What matters is whether we fight beside Griffith, the Hawk. After all, we're the band of the Hawk. She charges forward into combat and is rescued by the Archer Demon, revealed to be a hybrid creature, using the horns of a beast he's connected to as a bow. You go to such extremes. You're rather rash. Medium, what did you think you could do against that by yourself? You sounded like some peevish child during your speech. It seems you did convey your point. Griffith's forces take confidence in seeing the little girl rescued by one of the demons. All forces, heed my words, Griffith calls out. The war demons are mighty, but they can't check all of the enemies. Lure as many of them that get past the war demons as you can. Then after a volley of cannons and arrows, two lines of cavalry, then four lancer divisions will attack in groups. Band of the Hawk, once again, assume battle formation. 
and we see Griffith's orders are executed. And for the first time, human soldiers seem to be being effectively led against a demonic threat. And every time I think I understand just how protagonistic Griffith is going to get, he levels it up even further, now bringing humanity in an organized fight against these demons in a way we have never seen them successfully do before. Holy crap, this is supposed to be the moment of the protagonist like taking on the final boss and we're watching Satan essentially do it. Ah! I actually feel Griffith's glory in this moment, and that feels weird. But for panel after panel, we watch these armies collide, witnessing Griffith's deific ascension. As the battle reaches its zenith, Griffith is taken up by Zod into the sky, towards the head of the demonic god approaching. Dodging through its tendrils, Zod lands amongst the mask of undulating faces. We see as the stealth apostle also watches nearby. The f***ing artwork here. <laughs> Obviously, like, screw Lovecraft as a person, but in terms of realizing his style, this is, like, hitting in a way. I rarely have seen visual representations of Lovecraftian-inspired horrors hit. I still stand by that the Ganeshka design, well, terrifying and absolutely fitting the vibe it's supposed to, is also a little bit goofy, but the closer we get into its actual like innards and stuff and the weight of what it is kind of settles in, it pushes beyond that once more into the terrifying. And it feels like Mira is also just flexing because after showing us such a crazy litany of monsters throughout the series of Berserk, he's able to just pivot once again and bring us something totally new but also feeling totally realized. Ah, that's impressive. But from here we cut into a flashback where we see the origins of Ganeshka's rise, a life fraught with betrayal and brutality. And once an attempt on his life is made, we watch as Ganeshka makes a deal with a behelot, turning him in to the monster we met in the pages. The final words of this flashback being, life, the world, it's all darkness. In the all engulfing darkness, you fear, you see still fear, you writhe and creep, lightlessness, that is life. Cutting back to the present, we see a core within Ganeshka opening its eyes. Light, it's blinding, I can't see, it's warm, but I can't touch it, I'll be burned! Griffith's hand pushes through the light as he approaches the core. You can see, because he who bears light exists in the deepest shadow. Ganeshka sees Griffith's true demonic form. This finishing of what exactly Griffith is in the placement of all the layers of lore, I feel like I'm finally getting here. Something that brings light onto that which hides in the darkness, but is also not necessarily a good light, is so pitch perfect for how he hits the palette as a character. It explains the fear he brings to all, and I don't know, it's kind of this imagery, this sensation, this visualization of Griffith through prose that I just love. And it is within darkness that true light is discovered. The light is enveloping me. A stab, a blade made of behelet faces. We see the Skull Knight standing over Griffith, shock on Zod's face. Over the Ganeshka core, the Skull Knight slashes once again as Zod roars. I was waiting for you, the one who targets the God Hand at the Temporal Nexus, the Skull Knight. Griffith rises. You must have distorted space. Causality is brought to fruition with this sword stroke. Around Griffith, something splits the air. Once, twice reincarnated. And a sword stroke which reaches still deeper into the spirit world have opened the door. And then, I don't... A vagina opens. I did, that's just what it is. Like Griffith's position. This is some Robert Jordan-esque shit. 
right now. <laughs> but in this moment, it seems Griffith has taken the attack from the Skull Knight and his sword of interdimensional power harnessed that attack and is now using it with the energy of the demon god beneath him to grant his final wish. I don't know exactly how that's working. I'm sure the comments are going to explain to me very kindly and understandingly exactly what's happening here. But oh my god, the body of the demon god begins to be consumed by the portal, being fed on as the battle stops, all looking on in awe. A blinding light bursts through the sky as it seems the light begins to consume the world itself. On a distant ship, we watch as our party witnesses a wave of energy consuming the world. It passes over them, stripping guts of his shirt. <laughs> the final images of the transformation showing the final impacts on the world. We cut into Griffith's creation. Unicorns being chased through the forest by a serpent hydra. Spilling from the forest onto farmer's lands, we see harpies flying high above the hydra. More monsters are shown. Massive dragons. Which, this image of this dragon might be Mura's best flex yet. Oh my god, I love this dragon so much. Across the world, we see as supernatural threats become far more common and powerful. The dead rise, the unexplainable is witnessed, and shadows stir. Amongst villages, cities, nations, and peoples, for centuries, for millennia, stories have been told about them, as if they really exist. People fear them, yearn for them, yet cannot catch or escape them. Thus have they gone on imagining this other half of the world, and now it lies before their eyes. And we see two individuals fighting an elf sleeping on a leaf, knights looking out over a fleet of dragons. Mankind's desire, Fantasia. Within the dead dimension, the god hand stirs. Then we are just shown a series of images from Mura where I'm not exactly even sure what he's trying to communicate at times. This is fabulous and I love it and I hope it gets more context later, but I'm just enjoying it for now. And it does also partially just feel like during this a cataclysmic event, the author is just using this as an excuse to demonstrate the greatest of their abilities because this could all have been done with more abstract stuff and still communicated a lot of the same stuff we're getting, but you gotta just take a moment to appreciate a guy who within a few pages is giving us this, that, dear, ho, oh, this is one guy's art. Holy f A beacon of light has replaced where Ganeshka stood, a massive pillar of Griffith's power. The gigantic demon beast transformation of Ganeshka was put to death by Griffith, and a swing of the Skull Knight's sword of actuation turned Ganeshka into the source from which sprung a new world. The otherworldly light and wind that emitted from Ganeshka engulfed every nook and cranny of the planet. Thus did the world change. This new world was one in which creatures mankind had imagined and spoken of for generations suddenly existed. And we see a structure of light appearing as two trees twisted together, branches splitting the sky, like the northern tree of myth piercing the heavens and reaching to the ends of the earth, like the eastern tree of sutra where the sage meets enlightenment, like the western tree of ritual signifying the reasons of all creation, as if it were the origin rooted deep within all mankind. It was like the very essence of tree itself. And on the horizon, a glorious city stands. Monuments to ancient Greco-Roman looking soldiers standing with Griffiths. Architecture far beyond the capabilities of man. Is that the legendary city said to have sunk deep beneath Windham so long ago? No, it's too huge to be that. Majestic. It doesn't appear man-made at all. Well, perhaps that makes it all the more appropriate. If it's to be the capital of the new world, where the hawk shall sit and rule, it truly is Falconia, capital of the hawk. How fun is it that Mira really went Okay, this is actually maybe like the, oh my god, the Forsaken mythological city equivalent to Atlantis? No, it's even better than that. From the branches of the tree, we see Griffith riding Zod down into his glory. Armies march through the new world, coming to assemble in Falconia. We have to stop there for a minute for all the reasons. Griffith just 
remade the world in his image. What? <laughs> he has now combined the worlds of myth and man, escalating the supernatural within this world to an ungodly extent. What people used to have to only fear on the very fringes of chance encountering, now it seems will be a regular day occurrence. We have gone from fantasy creeping in to full-on Middle-Earthian level, oh my god, first age sh and now we gotta talk about how clearly Mura is being inspired by Tolkien in a lot of ways, but then adding that berserk twist to fabulous effect. I know there is just like obvious mythos that he could be pulling from alongside with Tolkien, but there are certain details here that absolutely make me feel like he is, well, obviously a massive Lord of the Rings fan for a lot of the things we've seen referenced in Berserk, but also able to add so much to it with his own personality and perversion, and I mean that in a good way, of these holier-than-thou concepts getting a super modern and gut-punching update it's so awesome holy fuck and i'm just now while i'm sitting down and editing this with twitch realizing how much the skull knight seems to have been set up here and utilized to actually create all of this meaning his ages long quest to stop something like this has presumably just been thrown back in his face and what's next for sir spooky i can only guess at. I'm just excited. I feel like this is a moment. I'm like, I'm getting the moment here. The first half of 12 had so little dialogue. It had so little like contextualizing what was happening and just communicating through Mura's art. And we got so much. And I feel like I'm really understanding an appeal of manga that so many people have been trying to explain to me for so long on the artistic side, aiding the storytelling overall. And I, I want to just lay the art on my flesh. I don't even know what I mean by that. Maybe tattoos? I don't know, but I just want to feel it. This is 10 out of 10 Berserk, the first half of 12. Maybe even 11 out of 10. Like, I love it. Unfortunately, the second half of 12 is a step down. Not into terrible, just in like, among my least favorite of Berserk so far. But I want to, before I get into that, just take a moment to process the level of I just got in a moment that is redefining how I feel like how far you can take a villain's arc and the level of impact they can have not only on a story but world. I've seen fantasy series where at the beginning the author really wanted to say okay the villain's gonna lose or the villain's gonna win to an extent and we'll undercut it but this is like full on the villain's gonna win. Our people are still just strugglers and like there is no defeating Griffith in a way anymore where it feels like you can truly make him feel like he lost. Griffith has won to an extent where even killing him will never truly undo his impact. He's succeeded in every conceivable way. Now all you could do is harm him physically and that's really it. Maybe like emotionally kinda, but in terms of legacy, Griffith just became the most important person in history for this world, not real world. But from here, we cut to pirates. And after having some interfighting, we see tentacles rise up and something attack the ship. We cut to seeing more beasts within the waters great detail there. I always maintain if you're going to have like a natural environment where there's horrific stuff on earth, you got to actually flesh out what's in the dark deeps down below as well. Because that's if, if stuff's scary on land, stuff is scarier down in those dark depths, just like it is now. This is a thing that exists in the world and is real. That's not fake. That's an animal. What? But we cut back to our party on their ship. We see Isidro is painting Shriek's face while she is meditating and under. She wakes up and snaps at Isidro and ha 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 jokes are had. I can't really feel the jokes right now. I am too much in the moment. From here though, we see that the pirate ship that we saw attacked by the tentacles is once again pursuing our party ship despite the utter obliteration they faced last time at the hands of the captain. Our party and the ship prepares for battle, but before they can engage the pirate ship, it is pulled beneath the waters. And uh, I just wanna say for this next section, 
I can tell that the author watched Pirates of the Caribbean and decided to do some interesting stuff with similar concepts, and I'm not mad. Actually, very well executed in terms of like also twisting Pirates of the Caribbean, because why not? Of course, we see it is compared to a legendary ghost ship, because spooky pirate ships are always awesome to include in a narrative. It is never not okay to slip that in. Even just a casual mention, it's the way to go. While the pirates appear to have some supernatural abilities now, we must also remember last time. Guts wasn't up to the fight last time, and now he sure on is. I'll never do that again, I'm so sorry. But as the pirates emerge from the water, nearly capsizing our pirate's ship, tentacles rise between the two vessels, and the captain of the pirate's monologues, These are our new brethren, yar. We may not be human anymore, but it turns out pirates and monsters kind of see eye to eye. Neither of us can ever snag enough prey. Eat up, me hearties. The tentacles begin descending, but we see Guts emerge, cracking his neck. My only criticism of Guts in this moment is there are crew members actively being eaten up by these giant tentacles, and he really seems to be taking his time walking up to join the fight. People are... It's in character, I can't even complain. But we see a blade slices through several of the tentacles at once, Guts stepping atop one of the downed limbs. Tell me, are these things edible? God, I love his one-liners! The battle resumes, Guts not even having to activate his berserker armor is able to take down the tentacles. He apologizes for nearly striking a crew member with his sword. Sorry, it's more cramped out here than I thought, and I'm only half awake. I might end up busting the ship up. That, I didn't realize that could be a problem, but especially if there's a situation while they're on this boat where Guts has to activate his Berserker armor, without thinking, he absolutely could obliterate the vessel they're on and then everyone would die. Shiver me timbers, who's this dog? How's his sword so huge? Guts carves his way through the remaining tentacles. They were supposed to be our meal. What a sad joke it'd be if they ate us. But no, mealtime has only just begun. <laughs> this has just been the Hordivores. The main dish is just starting now. And we see from what which the limbs come rises from the water, a larger arm with its maw gaping. Too bad for you. Those things that had you running to and fro were actually this critter's whiskers. Guts immediately whips up his cannon arm and shoots into the mouth. Utilizing the cannon's recoil, he propels himself into the beast, slashing even more damage as a secondary blow. Landing, he says, looks like nothing's gotten rusty from the sea breeze. He's just dishing him out today. He's just got him ready to go. N not bad at all, but new. We still have too late. Guts cuts off the pirate captain. What? These guys are combat pros, too. And we see the crew down below has loaded up the ship's cannons. At close range, they fire into the pirate's vessel. After a quick exchange of words, the pirate vessel retreats, dipping back into the water. The crew begins commending Guts on his incredible ability. The captain telling Guts, looks like I'm in your debt again. Just think of it as paying for our ride. They wonder what happened to the pirates after last time them just being normal, now seeing them as demonic creatures. Of course, they connect it to that magical wind that blew over them all. And we even see Roderick down below helping his crew like fix up the ship. <sighs> I might like Roderick, I don't know. But they find a nearby island to station at while making repairs, us seeing a naked figure watching their approach. But we see Shriek is on edge. Something isn't right. Don't you sense anything, Guts? Hmm, all about that. This thing's been acting kind of funny ever since that wind. And we see the brand underneath Shriek's seal is perpetually bleeding. It's like a wound that won't close. Yeah, because the demonic is all around you now. It's like in the air. They can tell something is off on the island. Shriek saying, I don't know anything for certain, but the entire island seems to be enshrouded by an ominous odd. It's probably best not to go inland. They're informed they won't be able to depart until tomorrow morning. Isidro is already exploring the island, finding the figure who was watching them earlier, a girl seemingly only a few years older than him. She warns Isidro not to go in a cave he's found. That cave's bad news. You shouldn't go near it. She spots Puck, who is adventuring with Isidro. Hey, is that an elf? You, you can see me? Isidro informs the girl he arrived on a damaged ship. She says, then no wonder you don't know. But still, keep out. The people of this island consider it taboo to go in there. Why? Are there monsters or something? There's an old legend about it. It's where the sea god lives. We see our party has walked into a nearby village, all of them noting how off it feels. Looking into a window, they see what seems to be some part of an octopus-like creature. Oh my god, the amount of times it took me to say, it seems they see some kind. Oh. We cut back to a cedaro, him asking, sea god? That's what it's called. 
but it's a sinister, dreadful god that sinks ships and eats people. That just makes it all the more interesting. Suddenly, I really want to go in there. I gotta go see if that legend's real or not. Puck atop his head, saying, roll camera. But Isidro trips as he goes deeper into the cave, turning, saying, there's something in there. Man, oh, well, whatever. Come on, my house is close by. I'll patch you up. Isidro drops his knife. Cutting back to our main party, they approach the octopus-like figure. What an odd statue, Roderick says. This is very old. It is a statue of an ancient god. Ancient god, Guts asks. As the doctrine of your religion spread throughout the world, the ancient gods were forgotten, and they faded into the depths of the astral world. The old traditions must have still been passed down here on this isolated island. Lady Farnese's brother says, A god, eh? It's certainly not as refined or as beautiful as our god's angels. I'm gonna walk around the island a bit, Shriek says. Everyone else, go ahead to the inn. We cut back to the Cedaro with the girl introducing himself. I'm Isma. Nice to meet you. So do you guys have to head back soon? Nah, we leave tomorrow. Then tell me all about your travels. About the outside world. Uh, sure, I guess, Cedaro says. The girl becomes incredibly excited, bustling about her apartment. We cut back to our main party within the inn. The atmosphere is deep sea dead fish on the wall and seaweed looking people, so very welcoming. Make yourself at home. We see the man working the inn say to the group, Sirs. Sorry, but please serve yourselves. I need to get some ingredients from the back room. Guts watches as the man slips into shadow. We cut to Shriek at the entrance of the cave. She finds Isidro's knife, thinking he must have gone deeper into the depths of the cave. Tentacles arise up before her. These are from the ghost ship, but they're different at the same time. Shriek uses her witch ability to see through Isidro's eyes. You see, Isidro is telling of his travels to Isma, just as she says to Isidro, You've got an elf with you. It only makes sense if you had all those adventures. I believe you. The outside world is a wild place. The front door opens. Shriek coming inside. She points the knife at Isidro's throat. This is a rare item. You really need to be more responsible with it. Here. Isma invites Shriek in, saying, Don't be shy. Come and get warmed up. Shriek sees something beyond about the girl. This girl, she's... We cut to some time later, after Shriek has cleaned herself up. Shriek asks Ismo to tell her about the island. There's just the one little rustic fishing village, and the villagers don't like strangers. They're all gloomy and crooked, and I can't stand them. Ismo explains that's why she lives on her own. I'm the village outcast. Well, there's that, but there's another reason. Because they're scared of me. You see, I'm a Miro. A Miro? They both ask. Isma tries to act like it was a joke. I guess I just wanted to think of myself alongside witches and elves. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. But it's true that a Miro is why I'm outcast. What do you mean? My dead pa used to be with one. So what do you mean? You really are a... Sorry to disappoint you. She shows her legs. I'm human. I swim as well as a Miro, but I couldn't soak in the sea all day, and my legs won't turn into a tail fin. Isma goes on to say that she's never actually once seen a Miro herself. I'm not even sure if I believe in that stuff. Either way, I got busy just living day to day, and none of it seemed important anymore. Because she then observes, If elves exist, which means Miros might exist too, right? But when Shriek asks why Yzma would be looked on negatively for being a Miro, who are supposed to be good omens, Yzma responds, That's because of this island's old sea god legend. A really long time ago, a terrible sea god rampaged throughout the sea around here. It attacked ships, ate people, and consumed all the fish. It was turning into a sea of death with no living things in it. A tribe of Muros decided they had to challenge the sea god to war. It lasted a very long time, and it lost many of their kin. The Muros finally confined the sea god to this island. The war was over, and the Muros left. Then, fish returned to the sea. But the sea god is very powerful, and as the full moon approaches, it stretches its long limbs from the island cave. They say it attacks this island's fishermen and ships that happen to be passing by. The islanders are afraid of arousing its anger, so they resent the Muros even though they supposedly benefited from them. There's some stingy creeps. But lastly, the island seems strange. It looks like the villagers haven't been out fishing at all. There hasn't been a soul at the docks, it's like they're all shut indoors. I saw some kind of thing staring me through a cracked window when I happened to pass by. They kinda don't look human, look more like fish eyes. Sometimes I also hear creeping sounds coming from the sea caves. She goes on to say that the strangeness extends into the water. We cut back to our main party. Just as Roderick is heading out to see how the pairs are going on the ship, he opens the door to see the population of the village gathered outside. And it looks like people with the skin texture of seaweed and the eyes of fish. And if that isn't nightmare fuel, I do not know what is. And as you would expect, the innkeeper returns through the back and a conflict begins. As it turns out, these people, of course, serve the sea god now. Tentacles begin attacking the party as we cut back to Shriek, who of course senses something is happening. Isma, I apologize. I just remembered something urgent. I need to get back to my friends in the village right away. Yeah, that sucks. You know, I'll take you there. It's dangerous footing at night. I know a shortcut. 
The party doesn't seem that pressed by the tentacles, Sir Pico even observing. I'm surprised to learn octopi can change into humans. Can't say it makes me want to eat any more of them. Still, just how many limbs are there here? This might be an entire village population. Yeah, this many arms can only mean one thing. The larger maws that they encountered before on the pirate ship rise up. There they are, thought so. But just as Guts thinks he's eliminated all within the village, an even larger army of tentacles has arrived. So I imagine all these tentacles are just like sourcing out from the god in the island, just like seeking in like a weird game of handsy with eyes trying to find the people. That's interesting. But as the Shriek, Emo, and Ciro make their way across the island, they witness what appears to be a ship rising along the side of the island. But just then the ship arrives at Guts' fight, the pirate captain calling out to Guts. Yo ho 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 ho! Scared ya, did we? This is a ghost ship. Absurd is what we do. I, I, wow. Stating that you're inserting an absurdist character. I'll take it. But after a little bit too much dialogue for my taste, the threats end with, Don't worry, once you're swallowed whole and digested bit by bit, you're completely reborn and then the fun begins. Hesitant to embrace his berserker armor without Shriek there, Shriek telepathically reaches out, shouting, No! At least wait until I'm there! But it's too late. The armor begins to rise around Guts. Moving with his typical incredible speed, Guts lands aboard the pirate ship and begins unleashing hell. Shriek, Isidro, and Isma look down on the fight, Shriek sweating with anxiety. Isidro doesn't understand Shriek's continued anxiety. But didn't he figure out how to get a handle on that at the Vertanius Harbor? Guts was able to maintain his awareness that time because I happened to be on his back and was drawn into the armor with him. Well, what do we do now? I will possess him, using my luminous body, and try to call out to his consciousness. Please guard my body for the time being. Shriek sends her astral form forward, but is rejected. I can't get through to Guts. We see Guts within the armor is actually biting into the flesh of the octopi. And I guess that's why they continually mentioned eating these things, building up to this moment so that it wouldn't be like totally weird. But I don't know, I already knew you could eat octopus. And quite frankly, if I came along one of these tentacles that was freshly cut off, I'd get it. I'd give it a little nibble. I'd give it a nibble. I don't know. Who doesn't want to eat a giant octopus? I feel like you're judging me. I'm going to eat a giant octopus one day. Costco begins to run off during the fight. Lady Farnese chasing her. Guts sees through his blurred vision the two forms amongst the tentacles. We see what Costco is running towards. The child is returned once again. It is a full moon. But when Costco is about to be attacked, Guts seems to have retained enough control to protect her. Lady Farnese witnesses this. Don't approach him! Shriek still calls out. The party regathers up. Shriek thinking, Now what? What do we do? As Guts turns to face them, the voice within his mind, Enemy, no fear, madness, sanity, violence, peace, slay, protect, kill, no, surrender, yield yourself. And we see the demon dog within Guts biting at its chain. Look, a voice cuts through to Guts. Focus your gaze here. Look, he sees Casca's face and the child before her, glowing. That's right. You know this. You mustn't lose it. You mustn't destroy it. Guts collapses, the armor pulling back from him. Guts, w what's happening to him? He's resisting the armor's odd. We see Shriek jump forward, landing on Guts, lending her power to help him resist the armor, pulling it off from him. And I've often wondered about how exactly the armor goes over his fake hand. And here we see it does actually just go over and consume his fake hand. And yeah, I like that little small detail of like us being able to canonically know, oh yeah, it just kind of goes over and does the same thing it does the other hand. So cool. Guts thanks, but also scolds Shriek for the very risky move, finishing with a smile. You saved me though. I owe you one. Well, I'm the only one here with the magic to do it. You owe her a lot more than just one, her elf chides in. Go on. Say you'll take care of her the rest of your- I'm not sure what happened, Yzma cuts in. But it was cool. You're so brave, Shriek. Guts notices Casca holding the child. The child is staring at Guts. And again, I have to be just extra cautious with the censoring here because I have no idea what YouTube will deem good or not, so please just provide my liberal use of this thing. Shriek thinks, there was a full moon the last time he appeared too. Nights with full moons have very deep magical significance and are full of magical power. He's appeared now during two of them. And how could I fail to notice he was here until just now? Just like last time, his odd is strange, though I can sense practically no hostility. Gus asked the child about the being of light that saved him. Did you do that? The child just clutches Casca tighter. The rest of the party is introduced to Yzma. She realizes, but it turns out I'm the last person on the whole island. Nice to meet you. Isidro asks if she can join them on their ship. It's cool, right? She's just one more person? Or, or what? You're gonna leave her? A kid, here alone? In this monster's nest? Is that how heartless that Ith Navy is? You the same as those pirates? 
but of course, Roderick says she can come. Yzma seems shocked at the idea to leave the island, but agrees. Roderick notes they need to just finish their temporary repairs, and then they'll be able to leave. Guts insists, though, they settle things here on the island, wanting to venture into the cave. Yzma says she'll take them. Shriep warns Guts. We also need to prepare before you march off into enemy territory, Guts. You got it, Spellcaster. I love their friendship, it's so wholesome. Here we see Lady Farnese get an exceptional lesson in magic, helping cast a protective spell around the ship. She's in awe of her own spell. That was splendid. Now you can truly count yourself among the ranks of the Magi, Shriek says to her. Guts looks down to Lady Farnese. It's your watch. You're our shield. It's a really good beat for Lady Farnese's character. I like how she got validated first that just being there to be who she is and act as a protectorate for Casca was enough. We had that reaffirmed and also the level of trust and appreciation the other party members have in her was also reaffirmed before she was then leveled up to then actually be able to contribute far more. It's like Mura saw the criticism coming of like, what was she even doing here before she was able to learn her magic? And he was like, uh, Lady Farnese was actually great in her own right before she got these abilities. Everyone appreciated her being there. It seems like respect towards the character crafted. Guts then says, now that the base is secure, we might as well get a move on. Guts even reassures Isidro though, a good soldier knows what he's capable of and completes the job set before him. And Guts' growth as a character, I love that he's taking on a more direct mentor role to everyone in the party. He understands what they are set to go up against, no one has as much experience with as he does, and also he is starting to open up and understand, yes, what was done to him was the worst thing arguably ever, but there's still good in people. There's still people worth fighting for. And while he has no real cause behind him, he is the forever fighter, protecting what he cares about, the antithesis of Griffith. And it's beautiful to see that concept help push his character into this headspace, believably, of someone who is able to make friends and be supportive. Guts, three deluxe volumes ago, wouldn't have believed being this sensitive and caring and understanding. Guts now? Absolutely. And it warms my heart. Shriek then asks to journey with Guts into the armor so that she can make sure he doesn't lose control. We see him resume his like half bat helm where it like doesn't, he's, he looks like Robert Pattinson Batman. Like I don't know what to tell you. And we see he has retained control with Shriek on his back with Shriek's spirit coming along for the ride. Guts is able to run across rocks into the water, back towards the island, out from the shield, and he goes into the dwelling of the sea god. We see old structures related to a previous age of worship, before more parts of the sea god come to encounter Gusts. There's more banter with the pirate, who I'm not gonna do more the voice of to save my throat, and also because there's just not too much more development at this time, and it's just another action sequence. Though I will say, he's able to impress me once again with his art, with this creature that seems to be the wit of the island? I was having a really hard time picturing like what kind of beast would be sending all these tent- I get it. Yep. I, that fits. Mura's ability to actually draw it, visualize it, and especially his work with scope and space within the panel is unparalleled. I've never seen anything like it. Eventually during the fight though, Guts ventures within the maw of this gargantuan beast. Jumping around wreckage consumed by the sea god, internal creatures begin to come after him as well, as the pirate takes his army of tendrils from the sea god out to confront the rest of the party. Cannons fire, and the shield does its job. Roderick gives the command to continue firing at will, utilizing the shield's advantage to its full extent. The pirate ship begins to push through the shield, crashing atop Roderick's ship through a hole. The pirate crew emerges, and a fight begins. We cut back to Guts, making his way deeper within the sea god. Utilizing his gargantuan blade, he's able to cut his way deeper into the beast. They manage to continue the fight back on the ship, Isidro taking on the pirate captain. And we get a nice little conclusion of his first encounter with the pirate captain, where he was like, ah, oh, you're just a dumb kid. And now Isidro's like, I'm doing better, and it's not even been that long. What's up? We see Yzma is even able to help Isidro in his fight, but Roderick's men begin losing ground. Yzma brings Isidro a bunch of pouches of explosive that have fallen from the cannon though. Isidro begins lighting them and throwing them into the mouths of the octopus maws. I love the slow escalation that's happening with Isidro and explosives. I hope it continues to escalate until homeboy is chucking RPGs left and right. With the utilization of explosives, the pirates are driven back once again. Yzma and Isidro have been kind of flirting this time and it, it, it begins increasing a little bit. Isidro got a love interest? Special thanks is given to Lady Farnese and the men cheer her for her shield and ability. And there's also a kind of arc we're seeing here with the perception of magic in the world where of course at first it was like the oh kill a witch on sight type deal but now we're seeing a 
student of witchcraft, which should be something where it's like, oh my god, we gotta stop her, instead be celebrated for an accomplishment of her utilization of magic. Very nice. Like, these are the things where it's like, Berserk is a series which has light within it once you look through the darkness. She's even called the seahorse's guardian angel. We cut back to Guts, a thronging filling the air where he is. We're being told just how big this monster is, not only from that big shot though, but now also seeing Guts having to go on such a hike to get to a vital organ, I guess. It's kind of interesting that there's this like, He's on his own little Hobbiton adventure within the Sea God. <laughs> and we get a little bit of Edgar Allan Poe here because the throbbing of the heart, which he's apparently reached, is so intense, Guts says, You can bet if I stayed here too long, the pulse alone would kill me with madness. I don't know if that's Edgar Allan Poe reference, but Mura is so full of references in his stuff, I am not going to discount it as such. But the pulse begins increasing, and we cut back to the child. As Yzma feels something terrible, and the child gestures towards the cave, the island rumbles, and the Sea God itself, dwarfing the size of the ship bursts from the land. Protectors of the heart come forward and, and Guts is confronted with the most eely looking sea monsters yet. This arc took not even my final form and kept going. Seriously, every, it's like first you get the giant tentacles, which are actually a part of the big maws, which are actually a part of the gargantuan tentacly thingies, which are somehow connected to the pirate vessel evil guy, which is a subservient bit to the massive god, which inside of it has layers of protection, which the greatest extent of which is an eel. Yzma notes, my home, it's sinking. The wave from the sea god hits the ship, Roderick commanding everyone to grab hold. Isidro is pulled from the ship and Yzma jumps in after him. Once she enters the water, tentacles come for her and Isidro. They're catching up. This voice, Yzma thinks. Speak, say it, say the name, say the name given to you that you know not, your one and only true name. Name? My true name? And we see Yzma has grown a fish's tail. She rockets from the water, the Cedaro in her arms. She lands amongst the crew, looking back at her legs, screaming, FISH! What? What the hell is this? A tail? A fish tail? W why? Did I eat too many fish? No. Is there a fish biting my butt? This... This thing's real! Calm down, the Cedaro says. Roderick begins giving orders to prepare to fire again. We learn that Yzma has learned her true name, which when spoken revealed her true form. Right when she's about to say it, Eva Lira warns her not to. Listen, elves, spirits, and whatnot have a secret name they can never tell people. That's your true name. Your true name governs your true form. You went back to this form because you chanted it. And if somebody finds out your true name, it means he'll have control over you. So never tell anyone unless it's someone you can really trust. Yzma says, I really wouldn't mind if you guys knew it. But just then a commotion in the water is noticed. There's a school of something gathering around the island. Are they dolphins? Look how many there are. They're beneath the ship too. And we see scores of Muro approaching the island. We see Guts struggling with the eel monsters attacking him, but he's finally able to push through. Bleeding from his ears, eyes, and mouth, he slams his sword deep into the heart before him, screaming out with a cough of blood. Yzma tells Isidro, it was all true, the legend and what my pa told me, before jumping off the ship. Yzma, Isidro calls. This is my island, and Muro fight against the sea god. And it's at this point I need to make a complaint, not against Berserk, but in what YouTube lets me show. I actually believe Berserk does a wonderful job of showing character development through how people's bodies change. Guts gets so scarred and his muscle definition changes as the story goes on to show just how haggard and exhausted he's become. Casca's muscle from when she was a jacked warrior is slowly deteriorating as the adventure continues because she's not fighting or training like she once was. This is great detail and I find nothing inherently wrong with showing a human's body. There is nothing, despite what Western culture will try and tell you, wrong with just showing a boob or something. It's fine. But YouTube will freak the hell out if I go and show a nipple or I assume talk too long about any form of the nudity or the body changing that happens within Berserk. So if that seems like it's notably absent from this, it's because I'm very afraid of what I can show or talk about. You've probably noticed the incredible amount of censoring I'm having to do in this episode. This is purely just a YouTube will slap the sh out of me if I do show it, 
so I'm not going to. And this is so bad that even on the privated, unlisted videos on my second channel I was sharing to a Patreon exclusives to show the uncensored angle of Berserk, my second channel got dinged for that even though they were unlisted. So yeah, I had to stop doing that, and I'm terrified to show a human nipple regardless of context if it's on a female because America. I'll end this mini rant by saying if you are one of the people who cannot view a human body part without immediately thinking sexually of it, uh, that's a you thing. Isidro grabs Roderick, yelling, You just gonna stand there and watch? This is no pleasure cruise, right? If we don't pick up the pace, we'll miss all the action. Roderick orders, Get us in range of that monster. Don't worry about its tentacles. Just be mindful of the surge. And that is where Berserk Deluxe Edition 12 ends. I very much so loved the first half of it, though the second half was just kind of like, we're doing another side thing again. I did really like the addition of giving us more imagery of old gods and what this world kind of felt like before the religious wave of the modern era took over. I feel like seeing that is also going to enhance the experience of witnessing Griffith's new world, but it does just feel like, come on, can we get to the elf helm so we can step to this next phase of the journey? Especially seeing Casca regaining her agency. It has gone from something I have been asking to happen to something I have felt is long overdue, to me feeling like maybe there's a purpose for waiting so long, to me yet again feeling like it is something that is long, long, long overdue. It just keeps, every time I see Casca, I just end up thinking of the Monty Python moment in Holy Grail, where the knight is running back and the knight running back is Casca gaining her agency and it's just never going to get here. My God, I hope it happens in the next Berserk Deluxe Edition. There was stuff in that second half I did like. Creature design's cool. You know, it's always nice to see Guts going nuts, just massacre and stuff. I hope Isma is a new addition to the crew. It feels like about the right time, though we just got Roderick, and I like the angle of ability she brings with being like a sea-type creature, though I don't know how much she'll be able to help on land. It's cool, and I like her personality. I also don't necessarily ship Isidoro and Shriek's crush going anywhere, and so having a Cedaro with a different love interest is something I'm for, though again, I'm speaking to someone who has no idea how permanent Yzma becomes. It's just with so much incredible stuff happening with Griffith, it feels appropriate for at the same time something reflectively as interesting or magnificent happening with our party, and I really wish structurally Casca was regaining her agency, her sentience, her ability to contribute right at the same time Griffith was making his new world. I would have bet a ton ton of money that those two things would have happened simultaneously. Actually, when I started Berserk 12, I was thinking to myself, okay, Griffith's going to have his victory, but Casca's also going to come back, and that's going to be really enticing. But we got through an entire another deluxe edition without that happening. Cannot wait for my deluxe edition 13 to get here Thursday so I can find out if maybe it finally happens then. In summation, I feel like this second half of deluxe edition 12 might get a bit too much hate, just gauging from what Twitch chat had to say about it overall, because there are still some really solid character moments and signs of evolution that I absolutely enjoyed here. But yes, in terms of stakes, pacing, and just the structure of this being here at this point in the story, it feels so odd, and I am very much so ready to get past it, and I cannot imagine how frustrating it was to read this at its release pace. Holy Christ. But overall though, still because of the first half especially, I am giving this a solid 8 out of 10. The first half is just BAM! Oh my god, new heights possible for this medium to experience 11 out of 10 rating. And the second half is more like a six to seven, so it's gonna average on out to an eight. But that were just this doofus's thoughts, and like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here, and I'm hoping next week I will finally get you all some Vinland Saga content that's gonna be very different from anything we've gotten before. Have a good one, y'all. I got books, I got a Patreon. Have a good one. Peace. Wake up, sleepyhead. Time to wake the dead. Don't question me. Just fall in line, sheep. Deep down in your soul, you need some.